Hey, what's up you guys? Welcome to another 10 questions with Caden with Campbell Cyber Dynamics. Today we're going to be answering big questions about websites and web presence. So let's get into it. So question number one, how do I have better SEO? So for those that aren't familiar with what SEO is, SEO stands for search engine optimization. And it's basically the method that Google and Bing and all these search engines use to bring your websites to the top when people search for stuff. Um, the two biggest things that go into search engine optimization is number one, your website's history. So if you have a really long history and specifically a history with certain keywords, that's gonna play a huge role in how you rank with your website. And that's why it's so important to be making consistent content and to have a consistent website. The longer you've been there, Google looks at it and says, oh, this website has been here a long time, it's reliable, it's got these keywords, and it will rank you higher on searches. Um, the next thing to do is to make sure that you have a lot of backlinks to your websites and references. So what that basically means is you have other websites linking to your website. It's kind of like if you go to a party and you meet a bunch of your friends there and your friends say, hey, there's this cool place down the road, you wanna go there? It's kind of a similar thing where Google is looking and scanning the internet and saying, oh, there's a lot of websites linking back to this website. This must be a good website. So that's what a backlink is. So those are the two main ways to improve your SEO. If you wanna just brute force it, just do like paid Google ads and of course money talks, right? It'll bring your website to the top of whatever keyword you want as long as you're willing to pay for it. Question number two. Best way to build a website? This is a good question because there's about a million answers on the internet. So I'll try to dumb it down the best I can. If you're building a really simple service, like you're like a one person hair salon, or I don't know, do something really simple, something like Squarespace or Wix is gonna do the job just fine. It has all the built-in functionality for you. It doesn't have the most customization, but it'll get you going right out of the gate. It's pretty easy to walk you through everything. The next way to go is to use a product like WordPress. WordPress is a little bit more complicated, but you can customize a lot more of it. So it's kind of an in-between where it's not fully custom, but it's still got a lot of the built-in functionalities um, that you would normally use, and you can customize a lot of it. And actually, most websites on the internet are powered by WordPress, so it's, it's very well supported. The last one, and my personal favorite, and what I'm really good at, is just building a custom website. So this is really good if you really want to like fine tune the user experience and make everything exactly how you want it. Some good frameworks, if you are a web developer, um, that I particularly use are Django, Flask. Those are two Python web frameworks that are really good. There's also frameworks in other languages like PHP and JavaScript that are also really good. So there, best way to build a website, there's your three options. Number three, what is the difference between HTTP and HTTPS? If you look at the URL, whenever you go to a website, it's usually got either that HTTP or HTTPS with like a green lock sign on it. And the HTTPS just means that your information is encrypted going back and forth. Whenever your computer uh, goes to a website, your computer is basically establishing a link to that external server to get the information to display the website. You use HTTP, there's no security on it, and that's just fine if it's just like plain text and there's nothing, no information you're entering on it. And what HTTPS does is it uses something called um, secure socket layer, which is, it basically makes the traffic encrypted so that an outsider can't read it. But nowadays with all of the different types of like cyber attacks going on and having HTTPS, is probably a must have if you want to have a reliable website that ranks good in Google and is just trustworthy in general. Okay, number four, um, what is the difference between a web host and a domain name? This is a good question. So if you haven't done a lot of web development, which is probably 99% of the people out there, um, this can get really confusing and it was confusing to me at first as well because there's just a lot of interconnected parts. A domain name is just the front end name of your website. It's like my business is called Campbell Cyber Dynamics. That's what it's, what's your website referred to as. The web host is where all of the information of your website is stored because you have to store the HTML, you have to store all of the code to your website and that needs to sit on a server somewhere what you end up doing is you tell the domain name 
that it's connected to this web host where your website is. And then every time somebody searches your domain name, it picks up information from the server that your website is actually on and it gives it over to the computer. Okay, question number five, are cookies bad? How would you ask such a question? Cookies are great. No, uh, so this is obviously talking about website cookies. Um, a lot of people are freaked out by cookies, so people will use like incognito windows all the time and they always reject cookies. Cookies on a web browser are actually generally a good thing because it establishes a connection, like a client trust between you and the website you're visiting. So think of something like amazon.com, right? What a cookie does is it basically stores a little piece of information on your computer that saves like what you were doing on that website. So that's why whenever you go to amazon.com, you don't have to log in every single time with your username and password is because there's a little cookie there that says, hey, we've been to this website before, he's already logged in, you're good to go. Just start shopping and you're good. So cookies can be really useful. Where people get freaked out about cookies is it is collecting information from your computer, like your IP address, your location, um, different information like that, just to establish um, that link. So for the most part, cookies are good, but some companies might try to use it maliciously and it is technically your data. So kind of what you wanna do. I don't really have a problem with cookies though. Okay, question number six, what are IP addresses? Um, IP addresses are basically like the computer form of normal addresses. So every time your computer visits a website, it needs to know where exactly that information is stored, right? Like we'll use my website as an example. If you go to campbellcyber.com, what's happening on the computer backend is campbellcyber.com actually corresponds to a specific IP address because my website is hosted on a physical server. My computer, when it accesses that website or when you go to campbellcyber.com, it knows that campbellcyber.com is associated with that IP address and that that IP address is located in X location. So it's basically just the location of where all of your content is stored. So that's why like your computer has an IP address because the web server also has to know where you're coming from in order to communicate with you. Okay, next question. What is GDPR and how do I make sure my business is compliant with it? So GDPR is basically the European data regulation uh, policy. Um, but it's basically like data regulation. And it essentially says that you have to alert somebody about what information you are collecting from them. And you also have to provide a way for them to um, edit the information or delete the information off of your servers. That's why like a lot of the websites nowadays, you have to click that little annoying accept cookies button, that little pop-up that pops up every time. It's because of that. So it's basically just a data protection law. You basically do those two things. Now I'm not a lawyer, but if you basically make sure that um, you let users know what information you're collecting and you allow them to retrieve whatever information you have and you allow them to delete it from whatever systems you have it stored on, then you're compliant. Next question, how do I optimize my landing page for customers? Okay, this is a good question that we can go into a lot of detail, but I'll leave you with three simple answers. So number one is something that is vastly overlooked and um, people should be made more aware of it is make sure that your website is mobile friendly. A lot of times business owners or web developers get carried away with making this beautiful, elegant site on the desktop because that's what they're developing in. But then when it comes down to it, most of the time, people are probably gonna access your website from their phones. If you, may, if you only focus on the desktop appearance, the mobile experience is probably gonna be pretty poor. So make sure your website's mobile friendly, make sure that all the menus fold up nicely, the text lines up nicely, and that it looks presentable. The next thing is to make your website simple. Now you don't wanna oversimplify it because that can get annoying, but make sure that like a lot of the like the functionalities of it, a lot of the buttons, make it intuitive for the user so that it's really easy to find the information they're looking for. And that actually goes into my third um, piece of advice, which is to make sure that you have all of the common information that customers would be looking for very easily accessible, right? If I am say looking for new tires and I go to a tire website, I'm probably gonna look for the size of tires that I have to see if they have them in inventory. Make that type of stuff really easy to access. If you run like a business, make the address 
really easily accessible, phone number really easily accessible, and other stuff like that that customers are gonna commonly look for really easy to find. Okay, next question. Is it hard to take payments on my website? How difficult is it to integrate a payment processor? This is actually pretty straightforward and pretty easy nowadays. Uh, there's a couple products that I would recommend. Um, I'll just list them right off the bat. You have Stripe, which is a huge product for um, processing payments. PayPal is a big one. There's another one called Authorize.net. There's one called Square. So there's a lot of these products that all you basically have to do is create an account with them and then you set up like a product and then you link that to your website. Now, one thing that I do recommend is when you set these up that you make sure that you're sending your website traffic off to this external website. So if you have Stripe, you actually have the person leave your website and go to Stripe's website and have them do things on the Stripe checkout. And the reason for that is because you don't wanna be responsible for collecting credit cards because then you're gonna to have to be PCI compliant. There's a lot of credit card regulations and tons of cybersecurity stuff you then have to worry about. So if you just take the customer, guide them to Stripe's website, have them check out there and then redirect to your website, that's the best way to do it. And it's pretty easy. Okay, next question. How do I advertise my website slash business online? There's a couple main ways. One is obviously like paid ads. Um, so Google ads are really good, Facebook ads, Instagram ads, all that fun stuff. Um, but there's also more ways than just paying for ads. Nowadays, you hear of like a lot of like Instagram influencers. What might be good is say you run like a gym or something, go and partner with a local influencer or a couple of local influencers and pay them a little bit of money to advertise your gym for you. This is, can actually be more powerful than paid ads because they're reaching an audience that they've already established a relationship with and they're recommending your product or service. So that's a good way to do it. Another one is like throw contests. So do like giveaways, um, things like that, that can create a lot of hype around your business. Then the last one is do a free promotion. Like one of my offers on my website is like to book a free consultation. That one's a pretty easy one, pretty simple one. Just offer something for free. Um, if people need it, that's less barrier to entry for them to get involved with you and just start a conversation. Okay, well that wraps it up for today. Thank you guys very much for watching and we will see you later.